Hello and welcome to this review of my ITT Courier 1101 something something something. I bought this off eBay a while ago with proceeds from selling one of my keyboards. When the seller showed me a picture of the switches, I noticed immediately that they were Honeywells and that they were in exceptionally clean condition, so I made him an offer and quickly nabbed it. It doesn't have a cable anymore, but that doesn't really matter because these Honeywell keyboards are not at all compatible with PCs unless you go through some intense efforts to reverse engineer them, of which I'm absolutely incapable. <laughs> Here is the model sticker of the keyboard. Seems like it's actually rated for 200, 220 or 240 volts. I hope that doesn't run through the actual keyboard itself. <laughs> It was made in England, as you can see, and a date stamp on one of the chips identifies that it was made around 1982. It's got a pretty cool color scheme of dark gray and deep blue keycaps, and what keycaps they are. They're massive chunks of double shot ABS. Just listen to the sound they make on the surface. They have some interesting legends on them, including a few printed on the front of the keycaps and a few with funky symbols like these two and these two which you can find on IBM terminals as well I think they mean home and insert respectively but I'm not too sure it's got a rather weird block nav here and a set of 12 programmable function keys here but there are no normal function keys on the keyboard for some reason the keys are actually in a somewhat modern layout. If by some divine intervention I do get this keyboard running sometime, it looks like it would be fairly usable, actually. Now for the switches. Possibly the reason why you're watching this video, right? It uses Honeywell Hall Effect switches, which have a semi-legendary reputation for quality, and they're based on magnets. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Oh! So what is the whole effect, and how does it work, and what advantages does it bring us? Well, I'll try to explain it in a very simplified way that's hopefully understandable to everyone. Basically, the whole effect is what happens when an electrical current sees a magnetic field, and the switches are just a magnet embedded in the slider that moves next to a sensor. Suppose we have a closed circuit made up of, say, copper wire, with electrons flowing from one terminal to the other, like so. Now let's zoom in on a bit of copper wire at the top, here. Edwin Hall discovered that if you put a magnet next to this, you can bend some of the electrons off their path so that you get electrons piling up at one side of the wire like this. Now let's take a look at a section of that wire. If you look at that, it has more electrons on one side than on the other, so it's more negatively charged on the top side than on the bottom side. In other words, there is a potential difference across the wire, but not along the direction of the current, but across it. This is called the hole voltage, and you can measure it. The hole voltage is dependent on the magnetic field strength, which is dependent on the proximity of the magnet. In other words, the closer the magnet, the higher the voltage. This hole voltage is amplified first because it's very small, and then it's sent through something called a Schmidt trigger, which is essentially an analog to digital converter. It goes on above a certain voltage and off below it. So in other words, at a certain keystroke depth, the switch goes on, and at another, it goes off, which is how it knows whether the key is pressed or not. It also uses this trigger to eliminate bounce or chatter and to cause programmed hysteresis, which is actually a desirable thing from a design perspective. So what's so good about this mode of operation then? Well, first of all, this mechanism is extraordinarily reliable. Complicated as they may sound, they're actually quite simple, with virtually no working parts. All they are is a sensor that feels a magnet slide by. Most electromechanical switches like Alps and Cherries last for around 20 million key presses per key which goes to 50 million if you use those fancy gold-plated contacts which degrade slower than others do. Capacitive mechanisms like the Model F and even foam and foil switches last for around 100 million key presses or more, by which time the mechanism is already virtually indestructible, so reliable that there's almost no question as to whether a random one will work or not. But these whole effect switches are even more reliable. How long do you think they'll last? 250 million? 500 million? No. 30 billion. Yes, let me spell that out for you. 30 billion. To put that into perspective, consider the following. Using an online program, I found the fastest I can type in a sustained manner is about 430 taps per minute. 
If I did that 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it would take me 132 years to wear out that one key. Or if you prefer a slightly more realistic approximation, suppose I have a nine to five desk job and I spent about half that time actually typing. I have a standard working year of 253 working days and I type at 100 words per minute with a spacebar after every one. It would take me almost five millennia to wear out just the space bar. God knows what machine they used to test this. Right, that's advantage number one. Second, these switches have the potential to be ultra smooth, unlike electromechanical switches like this one, where the slider physically moves the contacts, which inherently causes friction and therefore scratchiness. All these Honeywell switches are is a magnet that just bounces up and down near a sensor. They don't have to touch anything, they can be free floating if they want. See this here? This is the smoothest switch in the world. Why? Because it's not rubbing against anything. And that's why these Honeywells are really smooth. And third, Hall effect switches have inherent N key rollover. You know how in normal keyboard matrices, if you press too many keys at the same time, current can make its way from the drive line through the closed contacts onto the wrong sense line potentially causing unpressed keys to register? While on Hall effect switches, the sense line is completely separate from the drive line. They don't rely on closing contacts like membrane and electromechanical switches do. So there's no way for the current to make its way through unwanted circuits. So no reason for blocking, resulting in unlimited rollover. So with all this in mind, what are the switches actually like in the flesh? Well, unlike what you might think, these switches aren't actually immune to dust. If they get dirty, they can still get scratchy. These ones are very clean though, fortunately. I didn't even have a reason to clean them and look at it. As a result, they feel very smooth. There's no scratchiness at all. They made ones in various weightings and the majority on this board are type D1B3S, which are white angled stem ones weighed at a rather hefty 78 grams of force. Very heavy, especially for a linear board but it's the standard weighting for these switches. In my opinion, they're too heavy. I don't even like 60 grams Cherry MX Blacks. In terms of smoothness, they blow the cherries out of the water though. The larger keys aren't stabilized and as a result, they bind a little when you press them off axis, but they still go down pretty well. Even on the stepped keys like this, they go down admirably well if you press them on the lower bits, which is quite impressive. Not a lot of switches can do that. Unfortunately, there appears to be no way to open these switches though, so if they get dirty, it's going to be hell to clean them out, an important disadvantage considering how old boards with these switches usually are. As for the construction of the board itself, it's pretty admirable. It's fairly heavy, about 2.7 kilos, and the case is very sturdy plastic and it feels like a solid, dependable product. The only problem is that it's clamped together though, which is a little bit unfortunate. It's got fully adjustable feet, but they're not flip out like virtually all other keyboards, they're screw out. So you can set them to whatever height you like. A nice touch for sure. Also, this thing at the top is probably the biggest pencil tray I've ever seen. Overall, top marks on build quality for sure. So, final verdict? Well, what can I say? I can't use this keyboard, so obviously I don't know what it's like to live with this on a day-to-day -day basis, but really, what's not to like here? This keyboard is older than me, and even if it were abused really badly, it would still certainly outlive me as well. The keycaps look gorgeous and might as well be made from adamantium, and the layout isn't even that hostile. The switches are a tad heavy, but Honeywell did do lighter versions of these too, and they're really smooth. A very cool board overall. That's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and here is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.